my name is Sophie. I'm with Hackers and Founders. Our guest for today is um, Ivan Gaviria. He's a lawyer with Gunderson Detmer. He's been there for uh, 10 years. He's a business lawyer and he focuses on um, high growth venture back companies. Uh, Ivan is a first generation immigrant from Peru and he has three beautiful kids. Uh, in his spare time, Ivan likes to travel and he's been to Nepal and India, two of the most exotic places he feels. Uh, before we hand over the mic to you, Ivan, shall I say a lawyer joke? Please. <laughs> Only if it's a good one. Um, how many lawyer jokes are there in the world? Two. The rest of them are all true stories. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan, you have the mic. Oh, thank you for that delightful introduction. Um, is that okay, sound-wise? So, just real briefly, uh, the firm that I work with, Gunderson Detmer, we are a firm here in Silicon Valley who specializes exclusively in working with venture-backed technology companies. Um, we really only have two core practice areas. I'm a corporate lawyer at the firm, and I primarily work with companies that are trying to raise money from VCs, angels, equity investors, et cetera, in the hopes of, uh, you know, attaining either an M&A exit, an IPO, et cetera. And the other significant aspect of our practice is we also represent venture capital funds. And so um, a couple of the recent deals that we've worked on, we just took Etsy Public. You may be familiar with that company. Um, a few months ago, we took Viva Public. Uh, we represented Tumblr in their sale to Yahoo last year. Uh, we represent a number of local large startups, guys like Palantir, um, depending on where you get your food delivered, DoorDash is one of my clients. So you kind of get the picture. We generally work with high growth venture backed technology companies. Uh, on the venture fund side, we represent everybody from Andreessen Horowitz to Excel to Benchmark to Kleiner Perkins. Um, we do more venture capital financings than any other law firm in the country. Last year we did 1,200 venture capital financings and so about 400 mergers and acquisitions and about nine IPOs. So it's really, um, we basically do nothing other than I think what a lot of folks in this room hopefully are trying to do with their companies. So the, the genesis of this talk is, I don't know how many of you know Jonathan Nelson, the founder of Hackers and Founders, but I met Jonathan a couple of years ago, and for some reason in the meeting that we had, we got into the discussion of securities laws, and Jonathan, as I'm sure you are aware, is a, a very, very sick individual, and he, uh, to my shock and frankly dismay, was fascinated with the topic of federal securities laws and has been hounding me ever since to talk about it with you all. So uh, I apologize if you ultimately find you don't share his passion for what is undoubtedly an esoteric and, and dull topic, but I figure worst case scenario, if you run out of Ambien, you can always pull up the video on the web and use it as a sleep aid. So uh, I will try my best to have you leave here, hopefully with at least a general high level understanding of the topic and a couple of takeaways as to why you should care, uh, assuming that you are at some point in your career is hopefully um, going to raise money for a startup or be involved in a startup that raises equity financing, etc. cetera. So um, with, without further ado, let me move on. As the topic says here, this is really a very brief history of something like 80 years of legislation. So here's the, the real problem that we face is we have these two mutually exclusive sets, which is you probably need to know something about this stuff in connection with being a startup founder, um, but it involves the punishment of having to listen to a lawyer talk about rules and regulations, so I'm going to apologize in advance for that, but I do have a solution. This is really the only answer, is you've got to stay way up at the top of this. We're going to do just a very high level overview. I'm not going to try to get down in the weeds. I mean, frankly, even if we're near the treetops, it's probably going to be a complete disaster. So we're just going to sort of float high and uh, we can get into some stuff at Q&A if people have specific questions, but I'm just going to try and keep this as a real overview. So. Uh, a quick lesson on 80 years of U.S. securities regulation in a few slides. Here we go. 
You probably recognize these flapper girls from the 1920s. This is prior to the 1929 crash, and you know, things were pretty good. And the stock market was doing great, and the, the interesting thing was there was virtually no regulation, there was virtually no limits as we know them today on how people, you could sell stock in your company to widows and orphans um, without really any concern. And so, unfortunately, then things were really bad. And we had the Great Depression, soup lines, et cetera, and people sort of came to the realization that maybe it wasn't such a great thing that there was absolutely no regulation. So Congress stepped in, and what resulted from really the Great Depression was the basic legislation that we all live under today when you think about companies going public, when you think about raising money by selling securities. You've probably heard things like private placements and so forth. It really all comes from the aftermath of the 29 crash, and specifically, and I apologize, we are gonna have to talk a little bit about laws, um, but the two significant things that came out of that were the Securities Act of 1933 and the Exchange Act of 1934. And as many of you sort of think about, hey, what does it mean to go public? It really means two things. Um, one is the actual process of selling a portion of your company to the public. Again, going back to those widows and orphans, um, how, are we, how is the Congress going to make it safe for those widows and orphans to buy your stock? And the Securities Act is all about that. So if you've ever bought shares in a public offering or if you've ever seen those little prospectuses that have you know, about 90 pages of fine print and so forth, all of, those, all of that process is really around complying with the Securities Act. And the, the basic takeaway from that was, hey, we need to put enough information into the world about your company so that people can safely buy your stock and be able to make a decision about whether or not you know, they can, they're gonna lose their money, et cetera, so on and so forth. And so um, you know, that, that's really what, what is the core basis of selling securities in this country. And the companion piece was the Exchange Act, which basically said, okay, great, once you're public, how do we keep the public informed in a way that allows them to know when they should sell, when they should hold, when they should buy more? And so, you know, when you're paying attention to the business news and people are talking about earnings reports or, you know, quarterly announcements, et cetera, that whole universe of 10Ks, which is your annual reports, and 10Qs, which are your quarterly reports, and current reports on Form 8K, that, that whole uh, edifice is basically the 34 Act. And the, the basic takeaway is, is how do you keep current public information out there so that people understand what's going on with your company and they can make a decision about whether or not it's a good thing to hold your stock, sell it, et cetera. So, um, so that's really the, the core here. So Congress adopts the 33 Act and the 34 Act and we continue to kind of mosey along. And again, for a while things were you know, pretty good. Um, we had the 50s, uh, a nice period of expansion, post-war, capital was easy to get, et cetera. But, we went through another bad spell, and we had the big recession, the oil crisis, OPEC, et cetera, and so once again, our friends in Congress decided to step in, and what they were concerned about at that point was, well, it's just, it was too hard to raise money. And when the 33 Act was adopted, obviously not every company is gonna go through five years of audited financials and writing this 80-page prospectus and having investment bankers and lawyers and so on to do a public offering to raise money. By definition, you, you had to have exceptions to that. And so under the 33 Act, there was a concept of, well, wh what if it's not a public offering? How, how do I define when I can sell securities without going through that whole rigmarole? And that was what was called the private placement process. But the problem was, nobody kind of really knew what the fuck that meant. And when were you safe and when were you not safe? And as if you're relatively familiar with the US judicial system, it ended up being just a series of Supreme Court cases. And so all of these things were like, what if you're rich? Does that mean that you don't need as much protection? What if I only sell to a few people? What if I only sell a certain amount of money? All of that was kind of being argued in the courts and you had this series of case, case law that you had to sift through to understand whether you were safe or not. And that was perceived to have a dampening effect on people's ability to raise capital uh, and therefore a dampening effect on the economy. And coming out of that recessionary period, Congress said, hey, we got to do something. And so in 1980, oops, sorry. This was, uh, thought it was already on the slide. Oh, going the wrong way, here we go. So Reg D was adopted in 1982. 
And anybody who does a startup in Silicon Valley and raises money from venture capitalists, from angels, et cetera, is going to become familiar with Reg D. And the concept of Reg D was to say, hey, let's look at all of this case law that's been circulating, all of the Supreme Court cases, and try to try to come up with some basic ground rules so that people know when they're safe selling securities without doing the full-blown public offering, uh, and it'll, it's going to make it easier for people to raise capital. And so the idea behind Reg D was, hey, let's, let's make these safe harbors. So some of you have probably at some point in your startup careers heard of the concept of an accredited investor and, hey, what does that mean? And all of that was really just trying to codify these basic principles of, for example, well, gee, if you, really, if you really have a lot of money, you probably need less protection than those widows and orphans. Or if you've got sophistication and you've participated in this type of activity before, you know, if it's not a ton of people, if you don't kind of put an ad in the newspaper, gee, maybe that ought to be okay. And so Reg D basically laid all that stuff out. So accredited investor is simply a defined term in Reg D that says, look, if you've got a million dollars of net worth, not counting your principal residence, or if you have an annual income of $200,000 a year in each of the last two years, and a reasonable expectation of that income in the current year, you are in this magical class called an accredited investor, and that your companies are more free to sell you stock with less protection than they would be, um, you know, these widows and orphans we keep talking about. And so the rules that were adopted under Reg D, what they did was they laid out a very specific framework. And one of those rules some of you may have heard of because it gets blogged about a lot, which is everybody who raises money and they always say, oh, we want to stay stealth. We don't want people to find out about our financing. Do I have to, do I have to file a Form D? Well, that comes from this, because one of the provisions of Reg D was you got to file this document with the SEC that says, I raised money, here's who I raised it from, here's how much I raised, et cetera. And, you know, for a long time, nobody cared about that. But right around kind of the early 2000s, the SEC put all of that online and became searchable. And very quickly, reporters and bloggers and people who just followed the industry kind of got wise to the fact that you could find out an awful lot about which companies were raising money, who they were raising money from, et cetera, by just reading the Reg Ds. And so, you know, it kind of became a thing of how do I avoid filing a Form D, et cetera. But if you've ever wondered what that's about, it all ties back to this concept of creating a safe harbor because if you comply with all the provisions of Reg D, you knew that you had a private placement and that you didn't have a public offering and you were safe in having sold those securities. So the, the vast majority of venture capital financings that happen in Silicon Valley, seed financings, angels, whatever, they're all generally private placements where you're selling securities to a limited group of sophisticated high net worth individuals who are deemed by the law to not require the additional protection of a full-blown registration statement in front of the SEC that's got you know your financials and risk factors and description of the business and all this other rigmarole that goes into going public so so that's right deep so now we're in 1982 so we're moving you know that was 50 years in uh, nine minutes so Things are pretty good again. Um, in fact, I actually worked on Pets.com, I'm ashamed to say, but uh, there was a period of time in the late 90s when I think every week we were starting a new one. It was Hardware.com, Pets.com, Drugstore.com. I actually worked on the web van IPO, I have to admit, um, which is interesting because it all comes full circle and now we're doing all that stuff again. But in any event, um, unfortunately though, then you know things got pretty bad. The bubble burst. We went into the 2000. One 2002 tech recession, and um, you know, a lot of things happened. These are the uh, these are the Enron boys up here on this slide, and so uh, once again, our friends in Congress said, "Hey, we got we got to do something. Um, things are running amok." And so you may have heard of this thing called Sarbanes Oxley. It was in the early 2000s, and it was really a reaction to the excesses of the Enron era. But it was another layer of securities regulation. Uh, and, and what Sarbanes-Oxley did was, um, you know, the CEOs and CFOs now had to actually certify their financial statements and they could be subjected to criminal penalties if those things turned out to be false. Um, there was a lot more focus on internal controls and accounting. Um, there was a tightening of financial reporting. And, and you know people were going to jail, frankly. So so this sort of ended up having yet another 
pendulum swing from the standpoint that uh, it made people a lot more uncomfortable with going public uh, because all of these all of these regulations really only apply to public companies. And so again, it put pressure on, hey, how do I raise money without going public? And how do I kind of capitalize on these private placement regimes, et cetera? But in any event, that was, that was the next kind of major step in this, in this history and evolution. And then um, things were pretty good again. We had a lot of McMansions, we had the real estate bubble, it was a, it was a decent period of expansion. Um, but unfortunately, you're probably gonna guess what comes next is uh, things that got really bad. And we had our little black swan event in 2008, and it appeared for a while there that we were going to be killing our house pets for food, and that the entire Western monetary system was gonna collapse. And so naturally, Congress stepped in and said, hey, we gotta stimulate this economy, we gotta get things going again, and gee, you know, maybe some of the Sarbanes-Oxley reaction to Enron and some of the tightening on capital markets was a bad idea, maybe we need to try to juice this again. And I think there was also by this time, you know, a fairly significant realization that entrepreneurship, the startup world, and, and technology were just massive engines of growth and really, you know, the, I'm sure people saw around here, I mean, this area was probably the least affected by the, the global Great Recession um, and was one of the first areas to recover. And so now that, you know, we've got a Tesla in every driveway, um, you know, Congress is like, hey, we should have more of that startup shit. Like, this is good. And so uh, we had the Jobs Act, uh, Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act, which really was actually pretty interesting in the sense that in the 20 years I've been doing this, it was one of the first pieces of legislation that really very clearly focused on the startup industry as an engine of growth and said, hey, how do we facilitate that? And so this was um, kind of one of the, really one of the more meaningful changes in this whole regime of securities uh, legislation and regulation that I've seen throughout my career. Um, and you know, they tried to make it easier for startups to go public. So they said, hey, a lot of these startups are really what they, what they characterize as emerging growth companies, which is um, defined in terms of market cap and certain other features. And they said, hey, we got to make it easier for people to take these things public. They're creating jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then going back to our discussion on Reg D, they said, hey, maybe we ought to soften ourselves up on Reg D. And part of this was technology driven too. I mean, technology disrupts everything, right? And so if you go back to Reg D, one of the primary tenants was this concept you may have heard of general solicitation. You know, the SEC did not want people going around and, you know, putting ads in papers saying, I'm selling stock in my startup, who wants some? Um, but, you know, realistically, by the time the Jobs Act got adopted, if you were in Silicon Valley, you know, people were doing all kinds of demo days, whether it was YC or 500 startups, whoever, people were putting them on the web. I mean, you know, as a securities lawyer, it was kind of crazy because you'd go to these demo days and guys would be up here and the last slide would always say, I'm trying to raise 500K of seed money, please see me in the lobby if you want to talk. And so I think the SEC, as always, you know, was well behind the times. And I think the Jobs Act at least was an attempt to try to catch up on some of that. Um, and one of the other features that I thought was really kind of interesting, just because I geek out on this stuff, and it's probably not interesting to anyone, but uh, you know, one of the funny little quirks of securities law was there's a longstanding provision uh, in the 34 Act that said if you had more than 500 holders of a particular class of your securities, you were effectively defined to be public and you had to start reporting publicly your results. And one of the fascinating things that happened in Silicon Valley in the mid-2000s was you had this phenomenon where companies like Facebook and Twitter and Zynga and LinkedIn developed something that we never had before, which is a really active secondary market in private company stock with real liquidity before they'd ever gone public. In other words, people were buying and trading and selling, and there were investors, um, you know, the, uh, the Milner Group came in from Russia. There were all kinds of money that was being put into Silicon Valley with people basically saying, it's too late to get into Facebook or Twitter, so I'll just go find a bunch of employees who want to buy a house and offer them a bunch of money for their stock on the assumption that it was going to go public. And one of the reasons why that was pushed back against so heavily initially by Facebook and Twitter, and one of the reasons they started doing a lot of creative things to block people from selling their shares was this obscure provision of the securities laws that said if you had more than 500 stockholders, you had to become public. And none of those companies wanted to publicly release their financial results prior to their IPOs. And so the Jobs Act, when it came out in 2012, said, 
well, let's change that. And so now the number is whatever it is, 2,000 or 2,500, et cetera. But, um, you know, it's just kind of interesting the way that the Congress kind of reacted to things that were happening on the ground in Silicon Valley and has really tried to change the rules. Um, a couple, so they did modify the general solicitation rules. Now general solicitation is actually permitted in certain contexts. Um, they threw out this concept of crowdfunding. Uh, they're trying to soften the ability uh, or, or make it more easily uh, available for people to raise money, even from unaccredited investors. Now, in fairness with the JOBS Act, you know, the thing came out in 2012. They were supposed to release final rules that would actually permit people to do some of these things by the end of 2013. And it's now 2015, and they're still promising final rules by October. So some of this is still a little bit of a work in progress, but um, it's just interesting to see the evolution of it in a reaction to the way people are actually doing things you know, on the ground. So, um, so we talked about this, you know, it's now 2,000 holders instead of 500 and, you know, a couple other details here we could talk about. So inevitably, when you talk about securities laws, um, and I'm glad that I, most of you still seem to be awake, uh, the question has to arise, right, which is kind of like, why do I give a shit about this? And so, um, excuse me for a second. It does matter. Um, when you're doing a startup for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, look, it's still the law. And so if you are in breach of these rules or you sell securities without complying with these rules, um, there's a couple of things that can happen. I mean, certainly in a very egregious case, you can be subject to criminal penalties. Far more common is civil penalties. Um, and the classic remedy if you breach the securities law so you don't comply with the private placement rules and you know you sell millions of dollars to unaccredited investors or something is that those investors have what's called a rescission right which means they can then go to you and say you know what you need to buy back my stock and you know interestingly that really only comes into play it's sort of binary right it's like if the company is doing very poorly it could be kind of a disaster if you suddenly have a whole host of people that have a right to ask you for their money back um, and then the other extreme and this was made very famously um, by google which is i don't know how many of you remember but at the time of their ipo they had they had failed to comply with state securities laws with respect to their granting options to their employees and they had grown so fast and had spread so widely uh, and everybody was, uh, you know, the state's attorney generals, the SEC, were all well aware of the massive wealth creation that was about to happen. So everybody wanted to kind of get a piece of it. And basically, you know, 10 or 15 states came after Google and said, hey, you know, you, you violated securities laws in connection with your option plans. You've got to do something about it. And so on the eve of their IPO, they had to spend, you know, millions of dollars to do a rescission offer, which is they had to go out to all of their optionees in like 10 different states or something. I don't remember all the details, but, and they had to basically say, you know, do you want your money back? And obviously nobody in the right mind was going to say, yes, I want my 25 cent strike price back on this stock that's about to be worth 170 bucks a share. So it was completely ludicrous, but it did cost them, you know, a month and a half on their IPO. Uh, you know, poor David Drummond, who was the lawyer that was the general counsel, you know, had to go and testify before Congress, you know, had to have his deposition taken six ways from Sunday, and the company had to spend, you know, a, a lot of money doing this. So, um, so rescission is, is the issue. Um, in California, the statute, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but the statute of limitations is two years. So I guess if you fuck it up, just make sure that nothing happens for two years. And then, um, and then rights offering is what I was just talking about, which is the classic remedy for these things is you have to do a rights offering. You have to go out to all of these people who you effectively, uh, you know, got them to buy your, buy your stock without having complied with the securities laws, and you have to offer them the right to get their money back. Um, and then the next reason why you kind of care about this stuff is what are called the integration rules. And I promised I wouldn't get too far into the weeds, but there is a particular provision of Reg D that says if you do an offering and you do a, an offering with similar characteristics within six months prior or six months after, from a securities law perspective, they're all deemed to be one. So why do I care about that? The reason you care is you go out, you start your company, you've got some friends and family that want to put some money in. Uncle Joe is not accredited, but what the hell, you need the money, so you take his 20K, and then everything goes swimmingly, and three months later, you're going to go do a Series A financing, and Sequoia hires Investors Council. They look at the deal, and they say, oh, well, we don't have a valid private placement because our offering is integrated with 
the 50,000 bucks that you took from Uncle Joe three months ago who was unaccredited, now we don't have a securities law exemption, and gee, now we've got an issue. Um, and so it's kind of a weird little quirk of the securities law, but it's one that does get people a lot, and it's one of the reasons why when you tell your lawyer, hey, I really want to let my friend or my college roommate or my mom into my financing, people will often try to push back on that. It's not because they don't like your mom or they don't like your friend or they don't like your college roommate. It's because, you know, as soon as you introduce the concept of unaccredited investors, you've got this capacity to potentially poison a later round that might be critically important to the company. So, so you know, there is a reason to care. And the last reason, um, which I kind of define as, hey, I mean, I know lawyers suck and we all hate lawyers, and, and this is one area where it's true, as with a great many things you'll find in the startup world, often the real world risk, like the risk that one of your investors turns around and identifies that you fail to comply with federal securities laws and says that they want you to buy their stock back, I mean, what is it? That, you know, it's a very small risk. However, every time you raise money, when you sell the company, if you take the company public, every one of those transactions along the way is a process and that investor or that buyer or that underwriter, anybody who's on the other side of that deal is gonna do their due diligence on the company. They're gonna hire smart lawyers who are gonna look at everything you did. And a lot of times, unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's our job is to you know, identify risk. And the reality is that a lot of times that's what you're solving for, not the real world risk of somebody actually trying to claim that they want rescission. It's the non real world risk that the investor who's about to put $10 million into your company gets told by their lawyer, hey, you know, these guys have a problem, they didn't comply, you know, et cetera, or hey, these guys are sloppy because they didn't pay attention to this. And so, you know, it, it, it's why I say it's kind of lawyer sucks, sort of tongue in cheek, but um, it's a real issue, right? I mean, if you're doing a financing and you're trying to close, you gotta get that money in the door, the last thing you wanna do is to spend a bunch of extra time, and time by definition is money with people who bill by the hour, dealing with a diligence issue that was created because you didn't pay attention to this stuff. So. That at least is a, you know, a, a short version of why this stuff matters. And so again, I recognize that um, Jonathan may be one of the you know, two or three non-lawyers in the universe who actually finds this topic fascinating. Um, but I hope that at least gave you a little bit of an overview of kind of where these things come from, uh, why they matter, and why you should be thinking about it in the context of raising money for a startup. And, and any time you raise money, and by the way, one note on that is that you know, from a securities law perspective, it doesn't matter if it's convertible notes, if it's Y Combinator safes, if it's equity, if it's a price ground. You know, basically all of those things from a securities law standpoint are securities, <clears throat> securities that are subject to this regime. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there and see if anybody uh, actually has any questions. No, unfortunately you can't. Um, the way the private placement exceptions are defined, they basically limit the number of accredited investors and or, or unaccredited investors. So it's not a function of whether they waive their rights or not. It's, it just doesn't, it doesn't account for that. Or the corporation, you know? Oh, sure, yeah. Sorry, for the benefit of the recording, the question was, can you get around this if an unaccredited investor waives their rights? And the answer was that you can't, uh, because the way the exceptions are defined, they really speak to whether you have unaccredited investors or not. It's just binary, and there's nothing in the statute that addresses that whether or not the person wants to waive their rights. No, I, I mean, they did think of that. So uh, the way that the, the rules define an accredited investor. If it's an entity, you have to look through to each of the owners behind the entity and whether they're accredited or not. And so, yeah, it's, it's a little tough. You can't really work your way around it that simply.
So the first question was whether I was aware of a greater number of people in the Enron scandal that actually went to jail. No, I mean, I, I, I do, I'm not a student of the Enron scandal, but at least a couple people went to jail. So um, I don't know. You know, I don't think there was anybody broadly speaking, but I guess one is enough, um, at least from my standpoint. I wouldn't be too excited about being the one. Um, w there were actually, excuse me? Yeah, and then the second question, I, th I think what you're asking me is that each, that there are a number of different startup incubators, accelerators, and a lot of them have some sponsor that's a law firm who offers kind of standard startup documents and things of that nature, and you're asking whether or not there are really material differences, or if there's one or more that we, that I like or dislike. Yeah, you know, generally speaking, um, I think there's a lot of consistency. Um, I think that when you look at very early stage startup formation, I think over-optimizing is generally a mistake um, from the standpoint of cost and efficiency. I think one of the things that makes the, the market very efficient and makes things work quickly in Silicon Valley is there's this very broadly accepted notion of what's market, which is pretty unusual. Um, you know, for a relatively large market and for a relatively high number of deals, there's really not a very wide band of variation. So I, I certainly, if I were an entrepreneur, I wouldn't spend a lot of, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over should I use Perkins Coie's forms or Wilson Sonsini's forms or Ora Carrington's forms. The Venn diagram overlap is probably 98%. Um, I think where you start to get into significant deviations is, look, uh, when, you do, when you form a company, you know, you're really looking at, you know, okay, articles of incorporation for, or certificate of incorporation in Delaware, zero, it matters zero, they're all, they're all the same, and the variations are meaningless, and I'm sort of being flippant, but really, realistically speaking, it doesn't matter. The bylaws, all the big law firm bylaws are basically the same. All they do is track the Delaware corporate code. Again, kind of meaningless. Like if you want to go on clerky, if you want to go on legal zoom, you know what I mean? It's kind of a who gives a rat's ass, quite honestly. Um, similarly, you know, the invention assignment agreement that employees are asked to sign to assign all of their intellectual property, nobody negotiates those, standard form. If you look at 10 law firm forms, the deviation is like this much. So really the, the only area where you start to see significant deviation is two things. One is um, with respect to vesting. You know, there's an awful lot of variability in what people think is market for founder vesting and what people tend to recommend. The forms, the documents aren't all that different. It's what you choose from the drop down menu of options. You know, do I do single trigger acceleration, double trigger, 25%, 100%. You know, those are the things where there's actually some value to be added in thinking through what your choices are gonna be. And then the other area which I think um, is much more prevalent today than it was four or five years ago because we're effectively in, in year four or five of a fairly significant expansion um, I think the pendulum has very much swung pro-entrepreneur, pro-founder when it comes to terms and when it comes to venture financing. You know, I mean, if you go back to, if you can turn back the clock and go back to 2002, you know, the VCs could utterly dictate terms. And now if you've got a hot deal, there's a lot of leverage for founders to be able to dictate terms. And so we're definitely seeing more creativity and more energy put into things like founder protections. And I think a lot of it derives even from the, from the fact that it was so well known that when Facebook went public, you know, Mark Zuckerberg had all of this control mechanism, mechanisms that he had built in. Um, so we're definitely seeing more variation in that. You know, do you want to have the founders have 10 votes per share? Or should they have more, should the directors that are picked by the founders have additional votes? Or, should you have founder stock that can be sold in a liquidity event? You know, there's, so there's more of those kind of bells and whistles to choose from, but you know, my, my advice generically on those things is um, make sure that you've kind of tested the market enough to know that somebody other than your mom is willing to give you money before you worry about over-optimizing for founder control and for making sure that you, you, know, you are as well positioned as Mark is after your IPO, right? I mean, it's, it's almost entirely a function of leverage, and leverage in Silicon Valley is a function of demand. So yeah, if you've got 10 term sheets and you're oversubscribed and people are killing themselves to get in your deal, you've got a lot more ability to sort of play and toy with some of those things. Um, but a lot of times I don't think it's a good use of your limited dollars to really try to over-optimize that at the formation stage before you found out if anybody's even gonna fund you. Because the reality is, if you only got one term sheet, you don't have any fucking choice. So, does that answer the question? Okay. Great.
15, it, this might be tangential, but you mentioned that general so solicitation is now permitted um, as long as the purchasers are accredited. So I want to talk a little bit about AngelList. So I know they make sure their um, investors are accredited, mm -hmm. but how do they, stra it seems like crowdfunding. I mean, do you know how they straddle that divide? You know, I'd rather, honestly, I'd rather not answer just because I haven't dug into their particular situation or how they're how they're working through that. So, um, you know, I think I'd get into the weeds a little bit, but we could certainly take it up offline. There was a question in the back. So, uh, Rank D is for accredited investors. Actually, there are provisions of Reg D that would allow you to raise money from unaccredited investors as well, but there's two caveats to that that make it relatively uh, less useful. One is um, there is a rule under Reg D that allows you to raise up to a million dollars from unaccredited investors, but the problem with it is, again, this integration issue. So often, you know, that million might be useful, but if you don't, can't predict whether or not you're going to do your next round within six months, the presence of those unaccredited investors in that million dollar raise could then, you know, prevent you from having a good exemption if you do another round within that six months. And the second thing, which is a little bit more into the weeds, but if you comply with all of the provisions of Reg D, there's a federal law that then says that you're preempted from having to comply with individual state securities regulations. And the rule that allows you to raise up to a million dollars from unaccredited is an exception to that preemption. So I know this is getting a little bit um, esoteric, but sometimes that just makes it impossible to rely on that rule because if you've got a bunch of unaccredited that are in five different states, it may be either prohibitively expensive or there may be state obligations, whether it's filings, fees to pay, et cetera, that complicate the transaction. So you see fairly rarely do you see anybody rely on what's called Rule 504. Um, rule 506, which is the rule that most of us actually rely on for these big private placements, uh, because it doesn't have that million dollar limitation, you actually can sell to unaccredited if you have fewer than 35 in the offering, but the caveat makes it almost impossible, which is if you're going to do that, you have to provide all of this additional information and disclosure about the company, including you know, your financial statements, et cetera, et cetera, and, and most of those information obligations to really comply with them just make it prohibitively expensive or impractical for the average startup. And so, again, going back to my comment to the other gentleman um, about over-optimization being the enemy of the entrepreneur, you know, it's just so much easier to just not have unaccredited in your offering than to try to do all these various workarounds that inevitably have their own unintended consequences. So my uh, second part of the question is, how do you raise money from friends and family? Like, what are the Yeah, I mean, it's, again, you know, ideally you don't, but if you absolutely have to, you want to, you want to kind of make sure that you've got a credible securities lawyer helping you with that process. But um, what most people end up doing in a lot of cases is you've just got to take the lesser of evils, right? If that's the only money you get and you have to have that money and you've got unaccredited, um, it may be that you do end up relying on this Rule 504. You limit yourself to a million bucks and you just make sure that you don't do another offering within the next six months so you avoid the integration issue. Um, so there are, there are ways to do it, um, but you know, it's, it's not the preferred path. And the other thing that I will, I will make one more comment on friends and family, which is it's completely counterintuitive, but in, in the 20 years I've been doing this, it's sort of fascinating. Um, friends and family are often the first to actually sue you, and they're often the biggest pain in the ass as stockholders. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, it, it's, and it's one of the reasons to avoid unaccredited investors in general, is that people who do this for a living understand the risk. And people who are angel investors in Silicon Valley, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, they all know the statistics. They know that eight investments are going to fail. They know, you know that to a large degree, they're not doing it to make money, right? I mean, a lot of angel investors are doing it because they want to support the community, because they want to support their friends, because they think it's fun. Um, but they've got money to burn, right? Because if, you know, there's a lot of really great blog posts on this subject um, from angel investors in this, in this town. But uh, people who can't really afford to lose the money they're putting in uh, tend to be very challenging when things go south. And so... You know, I, I know that sounds like a funny comment to make because it 
they're, but they're my friends, they're my family. And, and I also have my own experience in advising entrepreneurs is that the level of stress and the level of kind of personal heartache when the company doesn't do well and, and you've taken money from your aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and grandparents is really challenging. I mean, just on a personal level, you know, it's one thing to lose money from somebody who is a professional VC or a professional angel and who, you know, decided that of the 300 million they made when their company got sold, they decided to take 30 of it to play around with angel investing. It's just a different animal than, you know, when your dad actually goes and pulls 50K out of his retirement account. So, look, it is what it is, right? Sometimes, you know, you have to get some money to get the company started and that's the only way to do it. But, um, but in, in, in my career, I have found that uh, if you can find any way to raise money from people who can really afford to lose it and who are accredited and who understand that process, in the long run, it just seems to work out better. Um, I've just always been surprised how many family dynamics can get really crazy when it comes to taking people's money. I know that's kind of a non-legal answer, but Yes, sir. So there, there's some platforms that are advertising that they can take uh, uh, investments in $100 chunks. Uh, how are they doing that and what specific laws are they following? So, you know, the whole regime around crowdfunding and the everything from the Kickstarters to the Indiegogos, et cetera, is a, is a pretty complicated area that would kind of be a whole other discussion. So I, I don't want to, I'm sorry to kind of defer it, but you know, a lot of those rules, some of them were only published within the last year. Some of them are only in preliminary rule stage. And so, you know, I, I'm very hesitant to really give much feedback on that just because I don't want to lead you astray. Um, but I will say in general, I, I think in the long run, the concept of crowdfunding from a lot of small individuals is ultimately never going to really be that meaningful because, you know, when you take it one step further, right, it's one thing if you can go get a bunch of, you know, retired people in Miami to fund your Silicon Valley startup, $100 a piece, but what, what happens in the end game when you're selling the company or when you have to do a down round and you have to provide disclosure to all of your stockholders that they're all about to be diluted because you couldn't get a new valuation? Or what happens when you're doing an M&A transaction and, for example, you know, you've got to get 75% of the common stock vote or whatever, and now you've, your vote is held by 75 different individual investors who each hold less than 1%. I mean, I just think there's a lot of complexity around that. And, you know, I, from what I've seen, even, even the really good platforms like, you know, that are available, um, you know, I still don't see a ton of hot companies relying on those types of funding sources or they're relying on them to kind of fill out around. You know, they've got a lead investor who's putting in a million bucks and they've got a couple of well-known angels putting in a half a million and maybe they get another 500K off of, you know, whatever the platform is and what have you. But um, I still think it's a challenging way to raise money and I think we haven't really thought through all of the potential consequences of having a very, you know, you're sort of getting the worst the worst of worlds in a sense, right? Because you've got this very broadly held stockholder base and now you're a private company and you want to get stockholder approval for, you know, your option pool increase or your next round of financing. And you've got all these kind of cats and dogs out there who don't have a personal relationship with you. You have no idea kind of who they are, what their motivation is. Um, I think it's going to be challenging. But in any event, I, 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 but, you know, I, I don't really know. I haven't dug deep into kind of the regulatory framework to be able to kind of Talk about it. On the other side, there's a movement to reduce the definition of credit investment. So mm -hmm. instead of having an income of 300000 a year or a profit to, say, 80000 or 100000 I mean, that essentially solves a problem in another way. Yeah, I actually think it's more going in the other direction. For example, a couple of years ago, they changed the definition so that your million dollars of net worth now has to exclude the value of your primary residence. And that was really fundamentally a reaction to the real estate bubble because there were so many people who had a million dollars of net worth, but they really, were, they really shouldn't be investing in startups. They just had a house in Palo Alto that they bought 20 years ago, you know. Um, what, what I am seeing more, and, and you, you may see this in some of the crowdfunding legislation that came out in the JOBS Act, is attacking the problem from a different way, which is uh, what some of the new regulations talk about is, okay, look, we'll let you invest even though you're unaccredited, but you can only invest a dollar amount that's 10% or less of your, you know, of your annual income, I think it is, or your, I can't remember if it's net worth or annual income, but kind of looking at it as, 
hey, we'll be, we'll be paternalistic in a different direction. You know, maybe you don't have a million dollars in net worth or you don't make $200,000 a year, so we'll just say you can only invest a certain percentage of your income. Um, you know, so that is one area or one way in which people are trying to, you know, the legislature is trying to innovate on that. But I think, if anything, they're going to go the other way because, you know, the accredited investor definition came out in 1982, as you saw from the slides. And you, when you factor in inflation and everything else, $200,000 income at that time was really identifying a different, a different socioeconomic class than you would say a $200,000 income defines today. So I think it's maybe likely to go the other way. Any other? Yeah, so there's a different regime. Um, it's called Regulation S for non-U.S. offerees. So that's that is an area that you can you can kind of explore, um, but it has its own limitations and so on and so forth. So I, I would you know if you're in the process of raising money and your only in source of money consists of people who are not able to qualify as accredited investors, then I would just strongly encourage you to work with an actual securities lawyer and kind of work through these scenarios. Um, but it's, it's challenging. I mean, almost every securities regime, even in other jurisdictions, if you go to the EU, if you go to other countries, a lot of them are modeled on ours, and even the ones that aren't, there just seems to be this sort of general mind meld around this concept that the richer you are, the less protection you need. And you can sort of see the logic of it, but you find corollaries to that concept in the, in the securities legislation in a lot of different jurisdictions, and it, it's just logical, right? If you're trying to come up with a set of rules for everybody, Seems reasonable. Hey, if you've got a ton of money, you can afford to take more risk with it. Yes. Um, yeah. Right. So public companies can still do private placements. So that's more of the advanced class than we probably want to get into tonight. But there are transactions that are called pipes, um, where you have a publicly traded company that can nonetheless do a private placement. So, you know, you're not, just because you're public doesn't mean you're excluded from the regime of private placement transactions. Um, and so that could include a, a, a Reg S placement. Yes? Hi, uh, another question. Do you actually see, uh, it doesn't matter who will be the uh, head of the next administration, but next four or eight years, do you actually see possible coming back or like not coming back? So, I'm sorry, see what coming back? Oh, Glass-Siegel. You know, um, I've said this in a lot of different ways over the years, but if I was able to predict things like that, the chances that I would still be selling my life in six-minute increments um, is virtually zero. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, it, it, it's so hard to say. All these things kind of swing with a pendulum. I mean, I think that's really the takeaway from the slides, right? It's sort of fascinating when you actually track it, how much the legislature is always chasing after, fighting the last war, so to speak, right? There's a big recession or whatever, and suddenly they decide they need to do something. And so, you know, I, I, I have no idea, but we'll see which way the pendulum swings next. So... All right, well, thanks, everybody. I hope uh, that didn't put you too deeply to sleep. <laughs>